In chapter 19, verse 8, when the bride is first revealed, she had made herself ready. And the Greek is in the past tense. She had made herself ready. And that's why she's there in destroying the Catholic system. And we have the bride again here. I will show you the bride. And you would think if you were being shown a bride, you'd see somebody dressed up beautifully. But the angel shows him a city. Because, you see, we need the two symbols to indicate the domestic relationship, the connection we have to Christ, and the city talks about our role in relation to the world. So our public role of saints. So we have two symbols that are going hand in hand. The bride disappears virtually after verse 9 because what we're going to see from there on is a city and we're going to see rivers and we're going to see trees of life, all of them used to symbolise the work of the saints. So in this section... We've actually finished the seventh vial. Now, you notice in verse 9, there came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials. Who'd like to guess which angel it was? Not the seventh one. He's finished. The sixth angel? Why? Yeah, the sixth angel is the, is the one that actually brings it right to Armageddon. You see, Armageddon is the pouring out of the seventh vial. The sixth angel is the angel of the resurrection. And he's talking to those who will be made immortal at that time, before Armageddon, before the seventh vial. So it's a different angel now that comes. And I believe it's the sixth angel. He's the most logical one to come to us. So the seventh vial is concluded. The history section is over. We're now looking at the qualities and the roles of the saints in symbol. We are the first fruits of the Lamb. This is the first part of the eventual new Jerusalem that will come fully into being at the end of the thousand years. And we are the first members admitted to this holy city, Jerusalem, which is from above. So where does he go to see it? Well, in verse 10, he's taken to a great high mountain. Let's go past that one. They're taken to a great high mountain. When you read about a great mountain, any Christadelphian would straight away think of Daniel chapter 2, where the little stone that destroys the nations and grinds them to powder grows to be a great mountain to fill the whole earth. And, of course, that's the kingdom of God, the kingdom of Christ and the saints. So we now have him standing on a great high mountain to observe this. And, again, you just get the symbols from the Old Testament being brought into it. So we have a great high mountain coming. And it comes down, the city comes down from heaven. So it's imposed from above. This is a divine rulership being imposed. And remember, this is not a literal city. John's seeing a symbol to portray the work of Christ and the saints. So here is a kingdom imposed from above. It comes down from God. Well, in verse 11, it has the glory of God. And it goes on to say in verse 10, it's called the great city, the holy Jerusalem. We need to ask the question, why does God use Jerusalem as the symbol of his work in the age to come? As the symbol of the final product when new and finished Jerusalem finally arrives. Why does God use Jerusalem? Well, we know that Jerusalem has been the place that God has chosen to place his name. Jesus was a Jew. Jesus will be king of the Jews. Jesus will reign on David's throne, which was set up in Jerusalem. And Jerusalem will be the capital of the age to come. And that's why when, when, when it comes to symbol in the Bible, Jerusalem is taken through as the epitome of what the saints are all about. Those that overcome will go, they'll be designated for new Jerusalem at the first resurrection. Jerusalem, which is above, says Paul, is the mother of us all. We all are in the hope of Israel. We're all part of this promise of Jerusalem being the center of the age to come. We're born in Zion, says Psalm 87. And in Hebrews 12, Paul says to the Ecclesia, you are come under Mount Zion. You're not at Mount Sinai anymore. You're not keeping the law of Moses. You'll come to Mount Zion. You're the part of the heavenly Jerusalem, to the spirits or the lives of just men made perfect. And you see the association of our immortality with the hope that is built around Jerusalem. So this is why God chose to place his name there right from the very beginning. God says, this is the place of my name. 
It's the Zion of the future age. So no wonder Jerusalem becomes the city that God uses to portray the saints in symbol. So the association is very clear. So what we have presented to John and what he sees coming down from heaven is this glorious cube city. And it's a very unusual city. It's not a literal city. Remember that? It's a symbolic city, a symbolic portrayal of God's saints. You know, what an apt symbol that you'd have a city to portray the ones who were living stones. You know, we are today being shaped as living stones to be part of God's final temple. But this is a city made up of many living stones. Remember, it's a symbolic representation of the community of the saints at the start of the kingdom. What the final product will look like may be slightly different for good reason, as you'll see as we go along. But again, this is the first stage of New Jerusalem. This is the preparation stage. This is the conversion stage for the world. And it will then be finally finished at the end of the millennium. I want you to get that very clearly. So let's look now at the city and the symbols we are given. And we have a number of things that you can pick from this record. And I'm going to do a lot of summaries from here on just so that we get through it. When we go through this record, we notice there are divine measurements, a very prominent wall. And John sees the wall in a number of different ways, but a very prominent wall, a huge focus on the number 12, a very unique foundation. It has gates of pearl with angelic doormen, a main thoroughfare through the city. It has divine light in it. It has a river of life, and it has life-giving trees. And we're also told one thing it does not have, one thing it doesn't have is a temple. And that's interesting, isn't it? And we'll come to those as we go through them one by one. But these are the key elements of the city. Now, it's built upon the fact that when you had most of the ancient cities of the time that John lived, they had walls, gates, main streets, citizens, public lighting and temples. And that was the way cities were built in those days. But this city has all of those things in symbol, but it doesn't have a temple. And that's quite interesting. So let's just go through now and take these one by one. The divine measurements. Any building you build, you have to have a plan and precise measurements. Otherwise, you end up with a disaster. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, God is called the great architectos of the universe. God is the great architect who designs all of these things. Every part and every item that is in this city has to conform to the divine specifications. Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone of our salvation. We have to be all aligned with the Lord Jesus Christ. We've got to be built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. So every stone has to conform, but there has to be a design. So divine measurements are critical in this city. The measuring tool, if you look at, when you come down to verse, um, let us see it, verse 15, he that talk with me, which is the angel of the, the sixth angel, of the sixth file, he that talk with me had a golden reed to measure the city and the gates thereof and the wall thereof. So the measuring tool is a golden reed. Now, in Revelation 11, you also have a reed which John uses to measure, but it's a different word. The reed that John has given is, is a, a reed that you would use to whip somebody with. It's a rabdos. It's a rod of affliction. And John had to measure 1,260 years of the persecution of his brethren and sisters. And John did it because he was representing those who would suffer under the Catholic system. But here we have a golden reed, and it's wielded by the angel. And when he measures, you notice that there is a perfect cube, and it ends up the city is, is 12,000 stadion or 12,000 furlongs they have here, but this is the word stadion, which is the Greek word, on each side. So it's a perfect cube, and that's the divine measurement given. In our measurements, a stadion was an eighth of a mile, about 220 yards or 200 metres, 
and it was part of the Olympic Games. And when you convert it to our measurements, 12,000 stadion is about 1,500 miles. So if you like, this city that John saw would have gone from Perth to Adelaide pretty well. Um, that's, that's the measurement of it. That's how big it was. So it was something that filled the earth in John's vision. Total circumference around the bottom was 6,000, which was, of course, the completed work of 6,000 years of developing the seed of the woman. The wall is 144 cubits in thickness. So cubit, of course, is from there to there. Um, 144 cubits, again, all about 12 by 12. But I want you to notice what it says in verse 17. And he measured the wall thereof, 144 cubits, according to the measure of a man, but not a human, to the measure of an angel. And that's quite a distinction that is made. The measure is based upon immortal nature. And we are promised that we will be equal under the angels. And here is an angel telling John that all the citizens are going to be the same as me, immortal beings glorified by God. And it's measured by the, the measure of an angel with a golden reed. Now, some of these things, some of these symbols that are here, we, we know them so well. I'm going to give you the easy one first, and that is the, the emphasis upon gold. You have a golden reed in verse 15. You have a golden wall in verse 18. You have streets of gold in verse 21. And we can very easily interpret that by going back through the scriptures. What does gold represent to the saints? Well, gold represents the perfection that comes out of trial and affliction. You know, God works on our characters, says Peter. The trial of your faith being more precious than gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, will be perfected and glorified and purified at the day of Jesus Christ. So our trials are like the refining process that metal has to go through to get out the impurities and to make a pure, valuable product in the end. And Job, who suffered terribly in the providence of God, he said, look, I can't find God in my life. I look here and I can't see him. I look here, I can't see him. Where's God in my life? But he hung on to his faith. He said, I know this, said Job, at the end, when God has tried me, I shall come forth as gold. So when you see gold in the record, like you see it right through this vision, it's all about the necessity of faith being perfected by trial. So there's a very simple symbol we can take straight away. Other symbols come from the Greek world, from the Olympic Games. A very common Bible metaphor is the use of the athletes that, and the way they trained and the way they disciplined themselves as the need for us to be spiritual athletes. And we know that at the end of each race or each event in the Olympic Games, the winner was presented with the laurel wreath, the crown of victory, I will give you the crown of life, said Jesus Christ, if you are faithful unto the end. And the stadion, the, which was the length of the Olympic sprint track, the use of the word stadion here as the word which we read as furlongs, tells us that this symbol of being victorious athletes and overcomers is also being brought into the record. So again, we can use the Bible, going back through the Bible to interpret the symbols. When you get the word stadion, Olympic Games, you go back through all the epistles where this is used over and over again. So that's an easy one to pick up. The number 12. 12 is the hope of Israel. 12 tribes. You know, Paul said in front of the, the, the Sanhedrin, I am standard judge for the hope of the promise made of God unto our fathers, unto which the 12 tribes hope to come. And Paul linked the 12 tribes and the promises and the fathers all together. And we are the hope of Israel. We are the Israel of God. We are Jews inwardly. We believe the promises to Abraham that we will be Abraham's seed in the kingdom. We will inherit with Abraham. And right through this symbology of this city, we have 12 gates, 12 angels, 12 names, 12 tribes, 12 foundations, 12 apostles, 12,000 furlongs, 12 gemstones, 12 pearls, 12 manner of fruits, 12 months of harvest, 144 cubits, 12 by 12. And, of course, back in Revelation 14, you get the 144,000, the hope of Israel in a perfected sea. So you can't miss it. It's based on the hope of Israel.
Absolutely clear when you go through this record and you pull out all the twirls. Now let's take some of the features of the city one by one. The city wall. The reason I start with this one is because it was the first thing that John describes. So he said in verse 12, the city came down. The immediate impact was to see it like a jasper stone or a diamond, clear as crystal. So this was something you could see right into it. It's like a big glass cube. But straight away, John says the wall was high. And, and through this record, John talks about the wall in verse 12, in verse 14, 17, 18, and 19. So obviously the thing that really impressed John first up was the wall. Because normally a city wall might be 100 feet high, 200 feet high if you're Babylon. But this wall is 1,500 miles high. And here's John standing there and he's, uh, uh, what, why? it's a huge wall. So he's very impressed by the wall. It's a wall of diamond. Brother Thomas says, you know, Jasper is the spirit condensed into substance. And that's a beautiful description of what the diamond represents. We know it's, of course, the most precious of stones. But the wall is clear and translucent. You can see right through it. Very much like when the angel in Exodus 24 walked on Mount Sinai and, and under his feet, you could, it became translucent. But now we've got this, you can see right through this wall. But why a wall? Well, a wall keeps out unwanted invaders. Nobody can come into this city unless they meet the qualifications of entry. So here is a clearly separated group of people from the mortal population that will remain upon the earth, bounded by a wall on all sides. It separates citizens from enemies. So it's very clear. Just look at verse 27. There shall no wise enter into this city anything that defileth, neither works abomination or supports lies. Only those who are in the Lamb's Book of Life are allowed inside the wall. So very clearly we're told that the saint community will be a community that God has separated, dedicated, and cut off because their characters are also perfect as their bodies are. None of that will be allowed to remain in this saint city. It separates enemies from citizens. The division that God has always used to separate the saints from the world is the one saving truth of the gospel. That's the wall of separation. It is now solidified in, by immortal nature, immortal characters, and a clear division exists between them and the nations that are being saved that you read about in verse uh, 24. They are outside the wall. This saint community, this symbol of the, of the saint community, is separated by the wall. Let's talk about the foundation. Every builder knows that a foundation is incredibly essential. It determines the shape of the structure, the strength of the structure. So solid foundations are essential. To be part of the saint community of the age to come, we have to have the gospel preached by the 12 apostles because they are the foundation. They took the gospel to the Gentiles. And the apostles give us the interpretation of the plan of God, picking up the promises of the Old Testament and telling us about how we can become heirs with Abraham. So the apostles are the foundation. But in that foundation, the foundations are now adorned with millions of precious stones, gemstones. So not just a concrete foundation like we normally see, which is pretty unsightly. You've now got a foundation that is actually, when you look at it, completely encrusted with 12 varieties of gemstones. And they are all the individual saints that are joined to the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Remember Malachi 3 verse 16? In the day that I make up my jewels, says God, I'll remember those that think upon my name, and they shall be mine. And they'll be polished gemstones in God's kingdom. Now, gemstones are judged by their ability to reflect light. You put light on a brick, and all you do is highlight the deficiencies. You put light on a gemstone, and it refracts the manifold glory of God in all directions. 
And we are the gemstones that God is forming by enduring heat and trial today and pressure. That's how gemstones come to be clear and reflective of light. But there are 12 of them, all of them based on the hope of Israel, but they are diverse. And in our immortal kingdom, we're going to retain our individuality. We're not all going to be clones. The angels aren't like that. They all have different roles, different personalities, different talents. But the Robert says, the gems show the diversity of immortal excellence, the diversity of immortal excellence. And it says in Psalm 149 that God will beautify the meek with salvation. And there's some of us like James Bain that need a lot of beautifying. But he will beautify the meek with salvation. You know, but he will retain the individuality. Get rid of all the imperfections that we have. You know, we won't need the glasses and the false teeth and the false joints. He's going to beautify the meek with salvation. Take away the deficiencies, but retain the individuality. So there are different gemstones, and all of them are attached to the foundation of the apostles and prophets. The diversity of mortal excellence will show in that foundation. The 12 gates of the city. And we're now knowing what it, how come they are admitted to the city, because the gate was the place of admittance to ancient cities. And gates ensure strict grounds of admittance. But who's on the gates? The angels who minister the ears of salvation are manning the gates as doormen. And they are very keen for us to be part of that city. So they bring us into the city. And on every gate is the hope of Israel. There are the gates all named after the, of the tribes of Israel. Again, the hope of Israel is the critical thing. But the gates are made of pearl. So each gate, when you open it up, is not a square gate like we would see. It's actually a round gate. And it's a huge pearl. And there are 12 of these gates that give admittance to the city. Well, again, pearls are shaped by tribulation. And we'll talk about that in a moment. And these gates are never shut, says verse 25. Because normally in the ancient cities at nighttime, they would shut the gates to protect the city from invaders. But there's no need to shut these gates. They will always be open to try and bring in more people to the hope of Israel. There's no mortality inside the city. There's no night there. And they will facilitate the worship. Look at verse 26. And they shall bring the glory and honour of the nations into it. Verse 25, the gates shall not be shut. But through those gates will come the worship and the respect and the response of the nations, as well as the, the things they give to the service of God. And we will be able to receive those things at the gates. So again, this is, this is why the holy city is different to the final product, New Jerusalem. It's actually got a purpose, and it's a relationship to the mortals. Okay, that's the gates. Let's go back to the pearl. As I said, each gate was, was a whole pearl in itself. Well, what is the pearl? We know it in Matthew 13. The pearl of great price is when you find the truth. You know, people who grow up in the truth don't appreciate what it's like to find the truth. My mother was one who sought and sought for almost a year to try and find some meaning in life and some religion that made sense. And when a brother who met her on a bus gave her up with Israel and, 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 and christened him astray, she said it was like finding the pearl of great price. And she was thrown out by her family. She suffered terribly because of her adoption of the truth. But she got the pearl of great price. And that's what it's got to be to us. The truth is the pearl of great price. But it also has a lot of other symbology about it. Look at the pearl and how it's formed. You know, in the depths of the sea, hidden away from human sight, God is at work to create something beautiful. And the redeemed are in their predation, hidden away in the depths of the nations. A grain of sand gets into the, to the oyster shell, becomes an irritant. The oyster then, to try and get rid of the irritating grain of sand, covers it with an aqueous substance, coat after coat after coat. And through much tribulation, will enter the kingdom of God. The outer coating has to then be removed. So you take away the pearl shell, and then you take away the outer coating on it, and you receive the beauty of the pearl once you've polished it up. We must shed the garment of flesh to be clothed with divine nature and reflect the glory of Christ. You know, what a beautiful symbol is the pearl, not just of the hope of the truth, but the way that God works on those who will go through the gates. 
The lessons from the pearl are very obvious. Formed in the sea, we know the sea represents the wicked nations we live in. Hidden from human view, created by irritation and discomfort. No glory is seen until it comes to the light. It's formed by clothing dust with glory. And no two pearls are ever alike. Again, the, the retention of individual personality. Pearls and gold are often linked together in the Bible because they symbolize a very similar process of refinement. And it was one of the most precious stones at the ancient times. So, you know, these symbols are just such wonderful lessons. Good, and we, we haven't got time to go off into the tangents of all the different gemstones. But there's so many lessons here we can take. Then in verse 21, we talks about streets of gold. And the word street there is, is the main thoroughfare. Most cities had a main road that went through the center of them. And this street is paved with gold, not literally, of course. You know, the churches talk about going to heaven and running around on streets of gold. This is a symbol. The gold also of the street is translucent like glass. So it's actually the most refined thought of gold you could ever imagine. Much more than man can refine gold. This is refined into clarity. And people can move in this place. People can be access this because they have refined faith. They have clarity of thinking in divine things. And that's what the saints will have. And they will walk in, in this street of gold. But then in verse 22, the thing that's not there is a temple. You see, in ancient cities, they always had a ziggurat. They had a, you, go to, you go to Europe, every city's got a cathedral. You know, every town's got a church. Because men had, have always had to find some way to get close to God. So they build a building and they think they can find God in that building. But this one doesn't need a temple. There's no dedicated place to go in this symbolic city because God is full of it. God is everywhere in this. Christ is there as God's representative. And we will be the glory of God ourselves. You don't need a place of worship in this symbolic city. It says, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. They are the focus that we, we, we go to that we might praise the Father and his Son. We don't need a building. You can see why it differs, don't you, from the literal building in Zion in Ezekiel. This is a symbolic representation of the relationship of us to God and Christ. And then we have the divine light of the city. The city has no need of human lighting. God, the glory of God is the constant permanent light inside the camp of the saints. The intensity of the glory from the dwelling of the saints and God and Christ inside this building makes the wall appear like translucent gold. So the wall, which is 144 cubits thick, still shines out the divine light in all directions. And when you go to Isaiah 60, verse 19, it talks about how the nations will all come, come, come to Zion in the future age. And it says in Isaiah 60, verse 19, your Elohim God, your holy ones, your mighty ones, your saints will be the glory of that city. They will be the light of that place. And because there's so much divine light in this symbolic city, there's tremendous clarity. You can see through the wall. You can see through the streets. There's clarity everywhere because divine light just takes all darkness away. All uncertainty is gone. And we will reflect the glory of God to the whole world. We haven't got time to go back to Isaiah 60, but just, just look at some of these tremendous comparisons to Isaiah 60, which is talking about the literal temple of the age to come. And look how it's been picked up in Revelation. Isaiah 60, the Gentiles have come to thy light. Nations shall walk in the light of it. The gates will be open continually. The gates will not be shut. The wealth of the Gentiles will be brought. The honour of the nations will be brought into it. Kings will minister under thee. Kings will bring their glory. The sun shall no more be thy light. There's no need of the sun. The sun shall no more go down. There's no night there. And this is incredibly how this is picked up from Isaiah 60. The people shall be righteous, the branch of thy planting. There shall be trees of life to heal the world. You know, it's incredible. We look at the comparison between the two things. Let's just come to, to verse 24. The nations of them, and you need to correct in your Bible the Greek. The Greek here is in the continuous sense. 
the nations of them that are being saved. That's how it should read. Continuous in the Greek, just like when you, the bride had made herself ready, that's the past tense. This is in the Greek continuous tense. The nations of them which are being saved shall walk in the light of it. So the care of the saints, the, the work of the saints will be to, to give light to the world. And the kings will come and say, you know, we're, we're not worthy to be kings. You know, we, we look at you as our kings. They'll bring their glory and honour into it. Verse 26, we will add to God's household as we teach them the gospel of the age. They shall bring the glory and honour of the nations to it. You know, bringing new faith, new converts, new gems to complete new Jerusalem will be our work. We'll bring everything that is good from the nations will come into this community of the saints. Many millions will also be made immortal because of our work. And then in verse 27, it's absolutely clear that this saint community, this bride city, there will be no ungodly, no false ideas, and the same principles of salvation that we'll be teaching the world. Now, chapter 22, verse 1 to 6, forget the chapter division. This is where I said chapter divisions are in the wrong place. It's a straight-on continuation. There's no new angel. There's no new vision. The same angel continues to show him something else. And we now have the extension of the work going out. So in chapter 22 of Revelation, in the first six verses, we have the river of life and the trees of life that go outside the city. And then in verse 3 to 6, we have coming back to the personal relationship between Christ and his saints. And at the end of verse 6, the angels are almost finished. John's going to have one more interaction with the first angel from chapter 1. But from basically from here on, Jesus directly writes the record. And that's quite interesting. So looking at this section, verse 1 to 6 of chapter 22, is a continuation of what we've been dealing with from verse 9 of chapter 21 onwards. The work of the saints. Well, in verse 24... We will be giving light to the world. The nations that are being saved shall walk in our light. So we are providers of the light of the truth to the nations being saved. We'll bring in the worship and homage of the nations. So we will be the, the priests that will take their worship to God. And then in chapter 22, we see the distribution of life-giving teaching. Verse 1, he showed me, this is the sixth angel, he showed me a pure river of the water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. Now, we know that the Ezekiel's temple will have a rivers or rivers going out from it. So it's picking up the symbols of Ezekiel's temple and putting it into symbology of the work of the saints in converting the nations. That river of life is divine teaching that saves. Let's just be clear about the difference between the literal temple and the symbolic temple here. In Ezekiel, we have a literal temple, a mile square, mountain in the middle, waters flowing from the top of the mountain, forming two rivers going down to the Dead Sea. That's the literal temple we're looking forward to as part of the kingdom of God. But many of the things in that temple are taken out and used as symbols in the description of the work of the saints. So it's picked up and used in symbology. For example, in Ezekiel's temple, it's on a high mountain. Holy Jerusalem, a high mountain. The frame of a city, a great city. A high wall, a high wall. Twelve gates, twelve gates. Gates on four sides, gates on four sides. Levites in charge of the gates, angels in charge of the gates. You start to see a little bit of difference coming in. No uncircumcised can go in, none defiled can enter. A measuring reed, a golden reed to measure the city. The river flowing from the temple, the river flows from the throne. Four sides of 500 reeds, again, a cube in this case. Medicinal trees, literal trees that will be for healing. Now we have trees for spiritual healing. So you can see how much it picks up from Ezekiel's literal temple and brings it across in a symbology to work out the conversion work that the saints will be engaged in. So we have the literal and the spiritual that need to be compared. 
Now, we know this, these glorious pictures, which Sister Denise has extended about, you know, showing us how pilgrims will make their journey up to Zion. And Brother Thomas said this, there is a deep spiritual significance underlying all that Ezekiel saw, which was later apocalyptically exhibited to John. So Brother Thomas could see that even though there's going to be all this exact literal temple as the center of the age to come, at the end of Revelation, Jesus picks up all the things, the details of the real temple and says, you saints are actually what this is all about. You represent the work that that will accomplish. You are the river of life. You are the healing trees. You will take the light of God to the nations. You will bring them into the covenant. And it's a very beautiful thing that the literal temple symbolizes the work that we have to do. We know that they will approach the sanctuary from the different directions as they come to it. The rivers of living water will go out of Zion, literally. The river of life will become two streams and drop into the Jordan Valley. So let's take these things. First, the literal. This is the literal temple of the age to come. There shall be a fountain of living waters. A fountain shall come forth of the house of Yahweh and water the valley of Shittim. In that day, living water shall go from Jerusalem, half towards the former sea, half towards the hinder sea. In summer and winter shall it be. So there's going to be in the age to come, in the temple that's going to be built in Zion, there's going to be streams of water that literally go out from that place to heal the earth. But, of course, in the Bible, pure water indicates divine teaching. You know, Jesus said, he that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. And this is the water of life that we see in verse 1. This is living water. And it comes from the throne of God and the Lamb. You know, the spirit that they would receive was a foretaste of the powers the saints will have in the kingdom. It was a down payment or a deposit on all the gifts that the saints will receive. And we will have that ability to teach the nations. You know, we might think today, well, I don't know enough to teach anybody. Well, that's what the spirit will do. It will lead us into all truth. It will open up our minds to the depths of the fullness of God's thinking. And we will go out like living waters to teach them about God. And we'll have a healing power to change their mortal problems. Now, there will be literal trees. It goes on to say in verse 2, in the midst of the street of it. Now, that just means a very broad river flowing strongly. It looks like a big, long street. In the middle of that street, on either side of the river, there was the tree of life. Now, it should be a forest of life, a forest of trees. The word tree there should be a wood or a forest or a great number of trees because it's on both sides of the river. It's not one tree. When you go back to Ezekiel's temple, there will be actual trees, trees for meat whose leaves shall not fade, new fruit according to the months, the leaves for medicine. So there will actually be healing trees that will actually take away some of the problems of mortality. You won't go to the chemist. In the kingdom age, if people want to be healed, they will come to those trees for medicine. Brother Sully points out they're going to be very unusual trees. We've never seen trees like this before. But there will be trees to, to cure some of the problems of mortality. That's the literal scene of the temple in Zion. But when we come here, we're talking about the work of the saints being like trees for healing of the nations. And so we see quite a different thing. Now, here's a corrected translation of verse 2 because it's, it's, got, it's not a good translation. In the midst of the broad space, so that's the great side of the river, the great river going out. In the midst of the broad space, on each side of the stream, there was a forest of life-producing trees. These trees have 12 fruit harvests. It's not 12 different fruits. It's 12 fruit harvests, yielding its fruit each month. And the leaves of the forest of trees were for the healing of the nations. So that's a much better translation of verse 2. Correcting some of the, the problems of the translators just didn't have a clue what they were talking about in some of these areas. So 
you know, this is what it's doing. There's a forest of life-giving trees on both sides of the river. So the stream is the water of life. The trees take the water and produce leaves that will heal the nations of their mortality. So there's not 12 kinds of fruit on one tree. There are 12 harvests every year that come on these trees. The idea is that they bear every month and there were 12 fruit harvests. Okay, so, you know, these are very special trees, but it's, it's the symbol of the work of the saints in bringing the gospel to heal the world. Trees of healing beside the river. These trees, fruits and leaves, are all symbols of the teaching, the leading, the priestly roles of the saints, and the spiritual wisdom that we impart to the mortals that will eventually cure their mortality. Now, I want you to notice the word for the healing of the nations. When a word's only used twice in the whole of the New Testament, it's critical. This one is used here and in Matthew 24, verse 45, in the parable of the good and the evil servants. The good servant brings forth meat for the, for the welfare of his therapia, his house of healing. And what Christ is saying is that the ecclesia should be a house of healing where people are encouraged, supported, mended if they need to be mended, healed by proper counsel and care and concern. And the good servant brings out things new and old for the therapy of his household. And that uses that word. And the second time the word is used is for the healing of the nations, for the spiritual therapy of the nations, not just curing their ills and their aches and pains and their diseases, but curing their minds for the therapy of the nations. So it's a wonderful thing when you get that, that one word, only used twice in the New Testament in those two contexts. Incredibly important. So trees. When you go back through the Bible, and this is what you do with Revelation, you go back through the Bible, and what does the Bible say about trees? Well, so often trees are put up as, as symbols of the righteous and the redeemed. This is Psalm 1. Blessed is the man that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners. He should be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in season. You see how this has been picked up into Revelation? His leaf shall not wither. Whatever he does will be prosper. So the trees symbolize the immortal saints. This is Jeremiah 17, verse 8. He shall be a tree planted by the waters that spreads out his roots by the river. He shall not see when heat comes. He's not worried by, by hot weather. Her leaf shall be green. She will not be careful from the year of drought. She will never cease from yielding, from yielding fruit. And that's what the trees of life do. They never stop yielding fruit. Every month, a new harvest. And we are the forest of life. You know, Revelation 2 verse 7 says, To him that overcomes, I will give to eat of the tree of the, the tree of the life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. So our change to immortality will be the equivalent of getting the tree of life again. And we'll become the tree of life to other people. We'll assimilate into our body from the first tree of life, never decaying, always fruitful, and spirit-filled bodies. That's what the trees of life are, the wood or the forest of life. Many of us, many, many trees that will be there for the healing of the nations. And here's the work of the saints, giving light, bringing in worship and homage, distributing the water of life, undertaking spiritual healing. The Bible from end to end is a common story. You know, most people in most churches just say, well, the Old Testament's all rubbish, it's all fulfilled, it's ancient history. We know the Bible from Genesis to Revelation is one story. There was a tree of life. Now there's a forest of trees of life. There's a river watered the garden in Genesis. Now there's a river coming out of the throne. There was the creation of Eve to be a bride, and now we have a bride prepared for a husband. A serpent deceived Adam and Eve. The serpent is bound for a thousand years. Sin came in. Sin is destroyed. Death introduced. Death is finished. The curse was pronounced. Curse is removed. The way to the tree of life was barred. Now the way to the tree of life is open. 
you know, what a wonderful book the Bible is. It's just from Genesis to Revelation, it's a consistent story. And there's the plan of God, starting and finishing with the same things. Then we come to verse 4. Now, verse 4 to 6, or verse 3 to 6, is one last symbolic representation of the relationship between Christ and his bride. There shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and the Lamb shall be in it. His servants shall serve him. And we're going to work furiously in the kingdom to administer the kingdom, control the nations, and to bring them to God. But look at the relationship. They shall see his face. His name shall be in their foreheads. So the divine thinking is imprinted on their minds. There shall be no night there. They don't need any lights, no light of the sun. They'll be living in the light of the glory of God, and they shall reign forever and ever. You know, wonderful, isn't it, that we will actually have that name. Already saying, this person's designated to be in New Jerusalem. This person's going to live to infinity. We'll have that written on our foreheads, that we are designated for infinity. And our job would bring many others to share that New Jerusalem at the end of the thousand years. We won't go into all of that. We'll just come to the last words where it says, He said unto me, and this is the sixth angel, remember this, the angel of the sixth file, the angel of the resurrection. He said to John, These sayings are faithful and true. For the Lord God of the holy prophets, isn't that interesting how God says, I'm the God of the holy prophets, sent his angel to show unto his servants the things which must shortly be done. As we pointed out in these chapters from chapter 19, 21, and 22, divine assurance that this will certainly come to pass. These things will be shortly be done. The sayings are faithful and true. And brethren and sisters, what a glorious thing we are connected to, that we can become the trees of life that will be the healing of the world, that we can be part of that bride and part of that city symbolized in such a beautiful way here. It's a glorious hope. And we must aspire to be there and thirst after righteousness. Mm -hmm.